welcome you today. Today is uh, May 3rd. Uh, we welcome you to the Latvian Evangelical Lutheran Church video service. We're glad you can join us today. This service will include communion. Again, thank you for joining us. As we prepare our hearts to worship today, I'd like to open with a passage from the first uh, book of Peter, chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you do wrong and are beaten for it, you take it you take it patiently. But if only you do right and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, as we come before you today to worship you, to learn from your word, we ask that you open our hearts, that you, uh, you fill us with the joy of your presence, and that your spirit guide us in all that we are doing today. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless grace, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and let me sing. scripture reading for today begins with Jeremiah chapter 23. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Our second reading is Psalm 23. The Lord 
is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you, Martin. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But because they do not recognize a stranger's voice, they flee from him. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray again. Father God, uh, we come to you today seeking wisdom. Your son has proclaimed himself to be the good shepherd. He has proclaimed that we who believe in him recognize in voice and will follow him. We ask, Lord, that you open our hearts today, you open our eyes to see the truth, you open our ears to hear his voice and to follow him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This uh, passage today, uh, I could actually talk on this for weeks. There's so much rich material contained in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. This famous sermon, whereas uh, we're in uh, Jesus declares himself as the good shepherd, is found only in the Gospel of John. It can be broken down into three sections. Verses 1 through 6 talk about what what Jesus is going to do. Verses 7 through 10 tell us why he's doing it. 
in the remainder of this passage, verses 11 through 18, tell us how he is going to accomplish this. What is he doing? Why is he doing it? And how is he going to do it? That's what we're going to look at today. This sermon is in response to a confrontation that our Lord had with the Pharisees regarding their excommunication of a blind beggar that Jesus had healed. Uh, We find that story in chapter 9. In fact, chapter 9 and chapter 10 go together. Uh, To put this uh, sermon in context, let's take a brief review of chapter 9. And you might uh, want to read this on your own. I would also advise uh, that as you read chapter 9, after you finish it, that you go to the Old Testament and read Psalms 27. I think you'll find um, new revelation in chapter in Psalms 27 after having read John chapter 9. Jesus and his disciples are walking down the road and they pass by a blind beggar. Apparently, this beggar was known to those in the community for his disciples asked him, why is this, was this beggar born blind? Did it have something to do with his own sin or was it the sin of his parents? And Jesus told them, no, it didn't have anything at all to do with personal sin. But he looked with mercy on this beggar and he told his disciples so that the glory of God could be known I will heal him. And he did that. He did something actually quite strange. He knelt down on the ground in front of the beggar and he spit into the ground and he mixed it and formed a sort of clay. And he took that clay and he anointed the eyes of the beggar. And then he told this uh, beggar to find his way to the pool of Siloam, wash his eyes. And when he did that, he could see. So the beggar obeyed. He went to the pool. He washed his eyes. And as the mud came off his eyes, his eyes opened. And this man who had not seen a thing his entire life could now see. As you can imagine, this was quite astounding. And those who knew him, his neighbors, his family, they were all astounded. His neighbors argued a bit about whether this really was that same blind man But they decided it was, and they didn't understand what had happened, so they took this man to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees began to question him. They questioned him actually quite sharply. And you can imagine um, the stir this was causing. And suddenly, here is a man born blind, um, at least from the Pharisee's standpoint, he claims to have been born blind. They began to question him. And as a man told them what, hand, what had happened, rather than be amazed, they were scandalized. First of all, this healing had happened on the Sabbath. And Jesus not only had healed on the Sabbath, which the Pharisees viewed to be a violation of the Sabbath, but he'd actually made clay on the Sabbath, which is, was a specific um, activity forbidden on the Sabbath. So they were scandalized that he would do this, And they proclaimed that the miracle actually couldn't have happened because it was a violation of the Sabbath, which meant that Jesus had sinned and God doesn't answer the prayers of sinners. So they were actually denying that this actually happened. They doubted that the man had been born blind or they thought maybe this wasn't really the blind man. Maybe this was someone else who was claiming to be healed. So they called in the man's parents. The parents came in. The parents were afraid of the, of the Pharisees. So all they would do was, was say that this is, in fact, our son. And yes, he was, in fact, born blind. But when the Pharisees asked the parents, well, how in the world does he see now? And the parents said, uh, we don't know. He's an adult. Why don't you ask him? So the Pharisees called the blind man and the healed blind man in again and began to question him all over again. Since they'd already questioned him, and they were asking the same questions again, the blind man um, was a bit irritated, and he said, I already told you all of this. I already told everything, and you didn't listen to me. Why do you keep asking me these questions? Do you want to be a disciple of Jesus as well? 
This, as you can imagine, infuriated them. They didn't like this answer at all, and they claimed that they were Moses' disciples and that they knew Moses followed God, but this fellow, they said, meaning Jesus, we don't know where he's from. The former blind man's answer to them was simple, elegant, and beautiful. Here it is. Why, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he comes from, and yet he has opened my eyes. He concludes his testimony to the Pharisees by by declaring, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The Pharisees' answer to this, well, they declared him a sinner and cast him out of the synagogue. This was the same as excommunication. He would now be be uh, included in the rank and file of the publicans and sinners. People would no longer associate with him, and he could no longer go to the synagogue or to the temple. This was a pretty serious thing. Jesus' reaction to both the beggar and the Pharisees is found in John chapter 9, verse 35, through the end of our passage for today, chapter 10, verse 18. It begins with this. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. In our modern Bibles, Uh, We have all these chapter breaks. Uh, They do help us find things. It is nice to have chapter and verses so that we can we can refer to them and and help other people find them. But sometimes they lead us a bit astray. There is no break actually in the event between the end of chapter nine and the beginning of chapter ten. It it is one continuous message. Um, So we're going to pick it up in. uh, Chapter 9, verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. You may remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in your eye is darkness, how great is that darkness? These Pharisees were in fact blind, not because they could not see, but because they refused to see. Sadly, it was true then and it's true today that those who, are, who see the works of God, that there are those who see the works of God and believe and rejoice and fall down and worship Christ. But there are also those who see the works of God and reject them and reject Christ and refuse to believe. We continue in chapter 10, verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice." But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus now turns from uh, his opening statement of the Pharisees being blind to the image of a shepherd and a sheep pen. This would have been well understood in in his day. To the Jewish mind, uh, the shepherd was a term of anyone who was a leader, whether it be a religious leader or a political leader, could be a prophet, could be a king, could be a priest. 
everyone who was, who was tasked with leading um, a flock was seen as a shepherd. So Jesus is using this term familiar with all of them. The image of a sheep pen also was familiar to the people of his day. There were two kinds of sheep pens. There was the one found in a village or a city, and this certainly would have been a sheep pen that was very nearby where Jesus was actually speaking. Um, the ones in, the, in a village or a, or a city had fairly high walls, and there was a gate in front of them or a door, and that gate was kept by a doorkeeper or a gatekeeper. Uh, the sheep pen contained the sheep of many flocks. It wasn't just one shepherd's flock. Uh, there were many, many flocks contained within the sheep pen. And when a shepherd came, if the doorkeeper recognized him, he would open the gate and the shepherd would call his sheep. Back then, uh, sheep weren't branded or marked in any way. Uh, they were they were trained to recognize the shepherd's voice. And the shepherd would call out to his, his sheep, and the sheep would recognize him, and only his sheep would follow him out of the sheep pen. The remaining uh, flocks would remain in the sheep pen. So that's the image of, uh, that Jesus is portraying. But there is another kind of sheep pen, and that's the one found in the country. These were rather less... Um, sturdy. They had lower walls, perhaps topped with brambles, and there was an opening at the beginning, but there wasn't actually a gate uh, at the beginning of these. Uh, the shepherd, at, as, as he took his flock into the sheep pen at night, would actually lie down in the opening, and he would, in fact, become the gate. Jesus is telling the Pharisees in verses 1 through 6, that they are not God's authorized shepherds. The sheep will not recognize their voice any longer. Jesus is telling his listeners that he has come. He has come to call his sheep out of this sheep pen and that his sheep will recognize his voice and follow him. In this case, the sheep pen is seen uh, as Judaism, it's the whole system that was in place. You remember that Jesus said he's come first to the people of Israel. And he is saying here that he has come to call people out of what has now become a very corrupt Judaic system. He's calling them out of this system and, and calling them into his own flock. He declares that he was calling the sheep out of this system and that they would recognize his voice and would follow him. It's an interesting fact uh, that shepherds in the West, shepherds we might be familiar with, drive their flocks. We all have seen the image of a, of a shepherd driving his flocks with the help of his dogs. He drives them from one pasture to another. But this is not the image that these people would have had, and it's not what happens in the East. In Jesus' day, it's even today, shepherds in the East lead their flocks. They go ahead of their flocks and their sheep follow them because they trust them. They don't have to be driven. They trust the shepherd to lead them and to keep them safe. And in fact, when danger comes, uh, the sheep huddle around even closer to the shepherd because they know that if you want to be a safe sheep, you get close to the shepherd. So that's, uh, I just found that interesting that, that sometimes we think that the flock needs to be driven to a certain place when in fact Jesus is telling us that if we recognize his voice, he will lead us to a place that we should be. Because the fact is, sheep need to be led. Of course, the Pharisees did not understand what he was saying. Uh, it was inconceivable to them that God could have any other system other than the one they practiced. Uh, they could not understand a thing Jesus was telling them, partly because they were deliberately blind. So Jesus now shifts, and now he's talking about a more country style of sheep pen. He's now talking about his own sheep, not all of the sheep, but only his own sheep. Verse 7, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. 
All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pastures. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now Jesus is telling those listening, that's both Pharisees and and, uh, other people that were present in the temple at the time. He's telling them that he's the gate to the door. Uh, You recall that... uh, country sheep pens didn't have actual gates. Uh, some have been bothered by this switch and metaphors in the middle of this this thing. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, as we grew up, at least as I grew up, my English teacher always told me not to mix my metaphors. And, and here it appears that Jesus is, in fact, mixing metaphors, which is a grammatical crime, I suppose. But you have to remember When Jesus is saying that he's the door, you have to remember who the door or what the door was in a country sheep pen. And the door was, in fact, the shepherd. So Jesus isn't suddenly completely changing. He's just reminding everyone that a true shepherd is the door. And he's saying, I'm the door. I'm the shepherd. And I take care of my flock. You cannot enter the sheep pen You can't be a part of this flock without coming through him. It reminds me of his statement found in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Only those sheep who enter through him will be part of his flock. There's only one way into this sheep pen, and that is Jesus. Why is he calling us? Well, he gives us two reasons here. First, those enter in, who enter in through him will be saved. These days, day and age, we shudder a bit at that term saved, but we use it because Jesus himself used it all through his ministry. In John 3, 17, we're told, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We are sinners. And because of that, we have separated ourselves from God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. From beginning to end, the Bible teaches us that the penalty for sin is death. We read in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It is only the extraordinary sacrifice of Christ that can bring us into a right relationship with God. There is no other way. The second reason he gives us is that he came to give us a full life. The Revised Standard has it this way. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Abundant life. Oh my. Abundant life is one of those things that um, we all want. Uh, The very idea, the very sound of abundant life um, fills us with uh, expectation. And abundant life is is, uh, one that lives out the fullness of what what God has called us to. It has little to do with material wealth. Although all too many have taught that that is in fact the meaning of abundant life, material wealth. But again, it has very little to do with that. It is that we are called to a rich and full life in Christ. It is a life lived in the spirit. It is a life of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a life that does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking nor easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It is a life that Christ would have led. It is a life that does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes, always perseveres. It is, in truth, the life of Christ in us. That is the abundant life. It is also a life that will never end. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is a life lived in the presence of God. It is a life described by those things that I've just mentioned, but it's also a life that will continue into eternity, into heaven. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. We do not live for this life alone, but for the life to come. It is our great hope that we too, like Jesus, will be resurrected and stand in the presence of God. So let me ask you, does abundant life describe your life? If not, perhaps you should be listening for the shepherd's call and follow him. So Jesus has now told us what he's doing and why he's doing it. Now he tells us how he will accomplish all this. We pick it up in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to pick it up again. This command I received from my father. Goodness, there's so much in this, in these few verses here and so little time left to us today. Let me just point out to you one or two things in these final verses. First, he declares that he lays down his life for his sheep. He's not saying that he's willing to give his life. He's not even saying that he will risk his life for the sheep. He's saying that, in fact, he will die for the sheep. It's fascinating to me that he says, um, he says it as if it's already happened um, because that was his ultimate purpose. He knows that that is what he will do. By the way, the word we have translated here as for actually means in place of. He lays down his life in place of the sheep. He dies so that they will live. He also declares that having laid down his life for the sheep, he has the authority to pick it up again. What an astounding statement that is. He will lay down his life in place of us. He will die the death that we deserve, and then he will pick it up again. He will live, and he said, because I live, you also will live. I also want to draw your attention to verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. He's talking about us. To Jesus' audience, there were two classes of people on earth, Jews and everyone else. The everyone else was Gentiles. While the Old Testament taught that eventually Gentiles would come to know God, it was thought that the division between Jew and Gentile was an eternal one, that there would always be a difference between Jew and Gentile for all eternity. It would have been shocking for his listeners to hear what Jesus had just said, to say that there would be only one flock, that he would call Jews and Gentiles to be together in the same flock and that there would be no distinction between Jew and Gentile, but only followers of Jesus Christ. There would only be those who follow Christ and who listen to his voice. 
Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And he also wrote, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whereas whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. We're all in the same flock. And that flock is the one led by the shepherd, Jesus Christ. What was Jesus doing? He was calling his sheep to follow him. And his sheep would hear his voice, know his voice, recognize his voice, and willingly follow. Why was he doing it? He was doing it, uh, first of all, to save them from the consequences of their sin. The consequence was a deadly one. Not only did he come to give them life, but he came to give them abundant life, a rich and full and eternal life. How was he going to accomplish this? He would lay down his life for his sheep. He would die in their place, and then he would rise again. You see, it took both to accomplish this work. In the words of the of the hymn, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Good Shepherd. I thank you, Lord, that he came willingly, that he lived on this earth, that he called us, that he called out those who would hear his voice, that he willingly gave his life for us, and that you gave him the authority to pick that life back up again. And now we know, Lord, that we can follow him, we can live this abundant life in a good relationship, in a right relationship with you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion, we're going to uh, be singing a song here. Uh, So as you sing the lyrics to this song, please start to prepare your hearts to receive the elements of Holy Communion. We will be singing Kungs Tava Asins Svetība. Kungs Tava Asins Svetība. Lord, the blessing of your blood is my only honor and glory with which I will stand before God when I enter heaven. As we sing this, let's prepare for communion. Let us sing this with conviction because it is an abstract way of saying what the communion means, what the gospel means. Or perhaps let it convict us because the Holy Spirit wants to witness to us that we still do not understand what this really means and have not accepted Jesus into our hearts. Ar ko priekš tieha valstā fešu, kad tēpēsīs es ieļjāšu. Tu nevainīgais dieva jārs, ka mūs likts mūsu soda mērs, Par ļaužu grākiem cieltis tu, lai grēciņākus izklāptu. 
Tad mani vaits aus tepesis, vai esmu es to pelnījis. Tad sācīšu un mans pēstītājs bija visā laba darītājs. As we prepare our hearts to receive the elements of communion today, let's go before the Lord. Our Father God, we come before you today knowing that, uh, that we have sinned and that uh, the only reason that we have access to you, the only reason that we are seen as righteous in your eyes is because of the sacrifice made by your son, Jesus. We recognize these sins in us, Lord. <clears throat> we ask you to continually reveal them to us so that we can ask your forgiveness that we can move on and remain in that glorious and wonderful relationship with you. We ask, Lord, that as we take these communion elements today, that we truly appreciate what it costs for our salvation, that we truly appreciate that our Savior's body was broken for us, that his blood was spilled for us, I ask you, Lord, to help us in this. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Would you also join me now in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, during the, that last uh, supper, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he passed it among his followers and he said to them, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I now ask you to join me in partaking of the body of Christ. After supper, he took the cup, and having blessed it, he said, this is my body, this is my, my blood, broken, <laughs> this is my blood shed for you. Whenever you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Join me now in drinking the cup of the Lord's blood. Amen. Father, I ask you to bless those listening, those watching this video today. I ask you to bless those members of this congregation um, who haven't been able to join us on this video, but, but we think of them and we pray for them. Lord God, I pray that you will, you will bless them and keep them and bring them into your fold. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <clears throat> 